Hey y'all, Scott here. I like candles. Sue me. I should stop ending sentences with that. But I like them. They're fun, and I just bought all these from the store on clearance. They must be clearing the shelves for even more candles. And I'm sure somebody new will make them. What the hell is this? Nothing beats a homegrown video game. A game made by the developers who crafted the series in the first place. Who better to make Eco than Eco? Hey, they made the worlds, they made the characters, they should know exactly what to do. Until they don't want to anymore. Things change, mom and dad don't give a shit anymore. You don't know why, it just happens. And when my parents give up on me, 343 Industries takes custody. Many game franchises have to go through a messy divorce at one point or another, and when there's nobody to take care of them anymore, surely somebody has an open weekend. More series than you may think go through this, especially long-standing ones. A shift in developers. Whether it's a one-time thing or it's permanent, tons of beloved franchises get new developers all the time. Sometimes it's for the best, sometimes it's for the worst, and many times it's for the eh. The shift can be blatantly obvious, with the tone or feel changing drastically. <laughs> Do you really think the Pac-Man World 2 developers would make Pac-Man talk? This is Blitz Games all over it. But sometimes, new developers replicate the original style so well that it's nearly indistinguishable from previous entries. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was the third entry in the Tomb Raider reboot series, primarily developed by Crystal Dynamics, and while they did help with this game, it was mainly done by Eidos Montreal, and I cannot tell any differences. It looks and plays exactly how you'd expect it to, and I feel like the lesser review scores were mostly because it was the third game in the series and not much has changed. Uh, people are getting a healthy dose of I'm sick of Tomb Raider-itis. But let's hear it for Eidos Montreal, the babysitters of the Tomb Raider franchise. Montreal is the one-stop shop for sequels to games not made by the same developers. You want a new Batman Arkham game not made by the people who made the Batman Arkham games? Do I have a city for you? Warner Brothers Montreal created Batman Arkham Origins which was made when they were trying to pump these games out every two years. The original developer Rocksteady was busy making Arkham Knight for next generation consoles, so throw it to the B team. If any Canadian territory could do it, uh, I guess this one. But yeah, you can kind of tell this wasn't done by the same people as the others. It's not bad, but the quality definitely isn't as high as the Rocksteady titles. It definitely feels like more filler than a true new Arkham game. They don't even include this one in recent collections. To the Wii U. But what if the new developers do a better job than the original ones? What if they best them in nearly every way? That's rich. Oh, it can happen, no doubt, but most of the time when a new developer takes over, it's not really because they show more promise than the original devs. It's not because they have better ideas or are more capable of developing the franchises. More often than not, it's because the corporation that owns the series wants it to continue with more games, but the original team wants absolutely nothing to do with it anymore, so you know what that means? I've always wanted to go to Montreal. I usually don't think about it that much. When I hear a new team is taking over development of a series, I don't immediately jump to that being a bad sign or anything. But yeah, looking back at a lot of these, uh, the last thing I would want is my child being raised by Capcom Vancouver. Hi, Scott Wozniak, Smear Campaign Enthusiast. I love dragging developers through the mud. In fact, I hate developers, each and every one of them. Especially if they try to make a Sly Cooper game. <laughs> That's why I need to weed out which ones are bad and which ones are really bad. We're gonna be taking a look at a few game franchises franchises that switch developers at one point or another and see what changed in the transition and if adoption is really the best solution to all problems. First up, let's discuss oh Microsoft is one of the shining examples of changing developers of their IPs, mainly because the original teams kept leaving. Bungie created the Halo series. Halo is literally the Xbox game, and because of that, when Halo 3 was positioned as the finale with the tagline, finish the fight, Microsoft promptly pissed themselves for five years straight. Bungie developed a few prequels after 3, but when Halo Reach released, they were donezo. Microsoft then decided to form a studio that's primary purpose was to just continue the Halo series, and they just couldn't stop finishing the fight. 343 Industries isn't a bad studio far from it. I mean, Halo 4 and 5 look spectacular, but fans just don't feel like this is Halo anymore. 343 isn't a studio making these games because they want to continue the series. They're doing it because Microsoft is telling them to. It's a similar situation with Gears of War, with the original developer Epic Games moving on, uh, Microsoft decided to structure a studio that was hell-bent on continuing the Gears of War franchise. And while Gears of War 4 and Gears 5, that's the full name, good use of words, are solid titles, they just feel unnecessary. It doesn't help that a lot of people blew their Gears of War load on the 360 with four games that kind of got sick of it. And similarly to Halo, the franchise's name just doesn't hold the same value anymore. Halo and Gears of War are kind of continuing for the sake of continuing. The original developers were done with them long ago, and Microsoft keeps them afloat because you can't have an Xbox without... Eh. 
and then Crackdown changed developers every time. This is a great sign. Real-time worlds to Ruffian Games to Sumo Digital. Now, some team members transitioned over from developer to developer, but let's be honest, the Crackdown series just got worse with every game. Sumo Digital's a pretty good studio, but they're kind of the babysitter of the series developers don't want to make anymore. They worked on Little Big Planet 3, while the original team at Media Molecule was hard at work on Dreams. It took seven years to come out, so I think that was a fair decision to have another studio work on Little Big Planet. And in my opinion, Sumo did a pretty decent job with 3. It felt like Little Big Planet, bad platforming and all. But what killed the game was the technical problems. So many bugs and glitches and long loading times. It pretty much killed this game right out the gate. And while this is a competent experience, it was bogged down by a lack of testing. I'm sure if Sumo Digital had more time with the game, Game, they would have been able to prove themselves worthy of the franchise, but I think the launch tainted their image. Many fans consider this to be the death of the series. But see, Little Big Planet 3 was a game I knew people weren't too hot on. On the contrary, do you ever just assume some games are enjoyed by a fan base and then use this? Oh my god. We got the Sly Cooper trilogy on PlayStation 2, a beloved set of stealth platformers developed by Sucker Punch. Now, I have no nostalgia for these titles as I was too invested in at the time, but I have dabbled in them since, and these are wonderful games full of style and life. It's a shame they fell victim to the great PlayStation curse. Yeah, make around three entries, get out. Most of the time, this is due to the original developers themselves wanting to move on, and in this instance, Sucker Punch began working on the Infamous series. However, hints of a new Sly Cooper game consistently appeared, even in Infamous itself. That was because somebody was willing to work on Sly 4 instead! That's right, the mystery case files the Malgrave Incident guys, Sanzaru Games, they're Perfect! They pitched a Sly Cooper 4 to Sony back in 2008. Sony then tested the waters by letting them remaster the originals for PS3, and soon they handed over the keys to the franchise for 2013 Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. It was okay. As somebody who's not a mega fan of Sly Cooper, it's difficult for me to truly go, oh yeah, this is way better than this. Like, I've seen a fair amount of people who weren't diehard fans of Mario Party say Super Mario Party was the best game in the series. The f did they just say? It can be difficult to judge the quality of a recent entry in a series if you weren't too exposed to the previous ones, and I feel that a bit with Thieves in Time. But from what I've gathered researching fans' opinions on this entry, the characters and style were tweaked a bit too much for many's liking. The story continued on from 3 with them going, oh, Sly retired from thievery, that was a joke. But overall, it didn't necessarily feel like they were pushing the series forward, rather they just kind of took what Sucker Punch did and tried to do it again. And even though Senzaru has made some quality titles, they are nearly as talented as Sucker Punch, I think that's very fair to say. From what I've played, this is totally fine, but the general consensus is the originals on PS2 are obviously superior, with Thieves in Time being a decent, albeit unnecessary, return to form. We got another series that disappeared for a while just to end up anti-disappearing with a new father in tow, Luigi's Mansion, one of the better compliments you could give somebody. A launch title for the GameCube, its primary function was to show off just how graphically impressive a Luigi's Mansion could be. So much dust and lighting effects, it was a very short game and the gameplay wasn't anything crazy, but it was a fun little romp regardless. However, this game has a huge fan base, people who love everything about it to death. This little game had so much character, whether we're talking Luigi, Professor Egad, the ghost, or the mansion itself, it was an incredibly charming and memorable experience. But it also had this light sense of uneasiness. It was still a family-friendly game in the Mario universe, but it was just eerie enough to have that perfect amount of spookiness to it all. It was developed internally at Nintendo, the EAD division, most known for developing the Nintendo games you actually care about. But when a sequel released 12 years later for the Nintendo 3DS, Next Level Games were in charge this time around, and results were somewhat different. Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon featured a new art style for the environments and original characters, which was much more angular and exaggerated, which I think is fine. It gives it a 1950s retro haunted house feel, but it's not nearly as atmospheric, and it always felt odd to me that they didn't tweak the designs of Luigi or Egad to fit more with the rest of the art style. The ghosts in the original look like dead Mario characters. They look like they were designed by the same people who designed Luigi, but here in Dark Moon, they don't even look like they belong alongside the boos in the game, the main ghosts we see in the Mario series. And with the game being on a handheld, they felt the need to alter how the game was set up. Now, there are multiple mansions and you have missions to complete, which makes the game more suitable to just pick up and play. Now, I don't really blame Next Level for this decision, but it's not the most ideal setup for Luigi's Mansion. However, they came back with Luigi's Mansion 3 and this is an improvement. Sure, the art style is still a bit mismatched with the regular Mario designs, but 3 makes up for it with absolutely gorgeous lighting and animations, phenomenal puzzles, and a setup closer to the original, albeit not the same, but 
it's totally fine. It's a sequel. It's supposed to be a bit different. I feel like the gameplay is far more engaging and well thought out than the original, but that one had far better atmosphere and is overall a more memorable and replayable experience. But hey, with 3, I do think next level games has proven themselves worthy of the franchise. I think both 1 and 3 stand on their own as equally good titles. 1 does some things better than 3, and vice versa. Dark Moon wasn't as good. I came not being on par with the original. That reminds me, Dead Rising! Dead Rising was all about surviving a zombie-infested mall for 72 hours, helping civilians and mauling psychopaths, and at your disposal is all of the above. The game's primary claim to fame was the idea that if you can pick it up, you can use it as a weapon. Couple that with how cheesy the dialogue and characters were while the story took itself as seriously as possible, we have ourselves a winner. The first title was developed internally at Capcom, and it didn't take long for them to give up. Dead Rising 2 was developed by Blue Castle Studios, and Capcom dug their work so much they bought them, and with that, Capcom Vancouver was born just to die. Dead Rising 3 was an Xbox One launch title, and finally we had Dead Rising 4 before death. Well, I've only played Dead Rising 1 and 4, and my opinion is... <laughs> oh god, 1 is better. 4 is obviously technically superior, it looks really nice, controls fine, there's so much on screen at once, it's pretty impressive. But it doesn't feel like we have as many options in terms of weapons like in the first game. It felt like literally everything could be used. Here it just feels like any average game. I can't pick up any of this. Just whatever the game decides is convenient for me to pick up at that given moment. Also, the big thing 4 advertised was the return of Frank West, the protagonist from the first game. Except this character isn't Frank West. He has the same name, he kinda looks like him, but the writing here is so much more self-aware and makes him out to be a wisecracking ass. The original Frank West was pretty serious, which made it more funny when the player decided, oh, let me be stupid. The serious story perfectly contrasted with the ridiculous weapons and cheesy dialogue, and they make things way too jokey in 4, and it just feels forced. But Dead Rising 4 is a decent enough game, I just think it isn't a great Dead Rising game. I don't really think the developers understood what people liked about it. It just kind of felt like they heard that people liked Frank West, but didn't know why people liked him. However, it's a fine overall game. But it doesn't compare to Oh Jesus God No. Mario Party's like people with skin. It's f***ing everywhere. The original party game. Get your friends together, traverse a giant board, and play a minigame at the end of each turn. Collect coins to purchase stars, and whoever has the most stars at the end wins. It was a simple concept, but it made for a phenomenal multiplayer experience. So much bullshit happens, it's magical. However, that bullshit is balanced out with pure strategy. Deciding the right time to spend your coins, or which direction to move on the board. Trying to win the most minigames, it all evens out to an experience that does require some strategy but is luck-oriented enough to be interesting and hilarious. Hudson Soft was the developer, and they kept at it for eight whole games on home consoles alongside two on handhelds. And they released a new one nearly every year from 1998 to 2007, and then... nothing. After three Nintendo 64, four GameCube, and one Wii game, the series stopped, which really puzzled me. Mario Party 8 sold insanely well, and for them to only make one entry on the console was absurd. The Wii was practically made for Mario Party, and they only made one? Well, the hiatus ended up being due to Hudson Soft going through some changes. Konami ended up turning them into a subsidiary before just dissolving the company entirely. They're just Konami now, and because of that, Mario Party's future was uncertain for a while. Uh, really, Hudson was the only one to develop the games. I'm sure Indie Zero developed the card game Mario Party E, and Capcom did some arcade games, but the B did the heavy lifting. But then, Nintendo had a great idea. Let's f*** up. This'll be great, let's have the company who developed Wii Party do Mario Party from now on. From great, I mean f***ing putrid. Mario Party returned with Mario Party 9 on the Wii in 2012, developed by ND Cube, and it just... wasn't Mario Party. Everybody was in a car now. That tears it! Whatever you rolled would move the car for everybody. You were collecting mini stars. Mini games just happened randomly when you'd land on a certain space. It felt like they were listening to reviews that were just really tired of Mario Party by then. I mean, I would be too if I had to review these games every single year. Most of them read like, Hey, Mario Party, this is getting stale and repetitive. ND Cube went, all right, let's do something different and worse. This style tried to simplify Mario Party, but ended up unnecessarily complicating it all. I think the original setup was far more immediately understandable. It's a board game, you all roll and move individually. Here, what the hell kind of board game do you all move together in a car? Because everybody moves together, you can't really strategize where you want to go because where you end up is dependent on what the last person rolled. 
and the boards themselves had a definitive beginning and end. They were completely linear, and all you wanted to do was roll enough spaces to get to the finish line, which just isn't that fun! I liked exploring the boards in the original games, making it to an item shop before friends did, strategically waiting around a certain area. This just feels like the goal is to get the game over with. At least the minigames were fine. That's the saving grace of every Mario Party. I don't think a single one has nothing but garbage minigames. They're all fairly alright. Thankfully, with their next entry, Mario Party Island Tour on the 3DS, they went back to everybody moving separately, but the game boards were still start to finish linear experiences. Definitely better than 9 style, but god this isn't great. Everything's just overly simple and bland. But at least with Mario Party 10, they had a chance to redeem themselves. It's the f***ing car again! They brought back the car from 9, and it really has not been improved at all. 10 is just another 9, which just makes it worse in my opinion. They could have improved things, but no! It's the same! There is a special mode called Bowser Party, which allows one player to be Bowser on the Wii U gamepad, where they're actively trying to hunt down the others and beat them. But this mode only has, like, 10 minigames to play, which gets old quick. Mario Party Star Rush on the 3DS was next. What the hell is this? Alright, so Star Rush is very different. You all roll simultaneously, which saves just so much time. That's the big selling point of the game. It's the Mario Party for the working man. Don't have any free time? Here's Star Rush. It's definitely the most unique one of the bunch, but really doesn't feel like Mario Party to me. So the next year, they made another 3DS game, this one being the Top 100, a collection of the best 100 minigames from the series past. This was a phenomenal idea. Why did they put this on 3DS? This game celebrates the home console history of the series. They have pretty much no representation of the handheld entries. I'd rather play Mario Party on a home console. I don't want to round up 3DS owners to play this. On top of that, this is literally just the minigames. The way ND Cube wanted you to play this is to just pick a minigame, play it, and move on with your day. Nobody wants to play just minigames. You need boards to hold that experience all together, and this game has one board and it just reuses assets from Star Rush. Thankfully, Super Mario Party came out for the Nintendo Switch, and as a step in the right direction, it goes back to the standard formula of the original games, but there's only four boards, and they all stink! They're all really tiny and are based on a grid, which makes them super bland. I mean, they're doing better than they have before, but I never trust a man who prefers Super to Six. The thing is, though, most of these were negative changes, developers that didn't really know how to recapture the magic of the original games, but just take a look at these. Sonic Mania, fans from three different studios coming together to make a 2D Sonic game even better than the originals. And Metroid Prime, Retro Studios bringing the series into 3D in one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, and bringing Donkey Kong Country back. The original three were great, but the two Retro made are some of the greatest platformers of all time. Yoshi's Woolly World, I'd say, is on par with Yoshi's Island. And then they follow that up with this. But the point is, even then, sometimes new people can bring new ideas. They can be more knowledgeable about where a series should go, more so than the people who actually created it. But damn it, that isn't the case with candles.